Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. An original adaptation written and read for you by John Buckeridge. Part 8 The Wisdom of the Wirral Gawain rode for some time. At every town or village he entered, he would ask if they knew of the Green Chapel or the Green Knight who dwelt there, but none did. Hours turned into days, and still he rode, sleeping rough and foraging for food. He passed the holy island of Anglesey and rode still further north, wishing his journey was taking place at a warmer time of year. Eventually he came to a land known as the Wirral. Gawain had heard of this place, though he had never been there. It had a somewhat unusual reputation. It was said that the people there were hardy and tough, but there were few who feared God, and the old ways were rife here. Gawain was not certain how he would be greeted in such a place, and so as he rode towards a small village he was on his guard. As he approached the first house, a voice called out to him, "'Here, that's a fine horse you got there, lad. Where'd you get him?' From a small cottage at the end of a well-tended garden path a figure emerged. The first thing Gawain noticed was his smile. It was the warmest and most welcoming smile he had ever seen. It wasn't just a smile with the mouth, as Gawain had practiced to charm ladies. It was a smile that included the man's whole face. His eyes crinkled up with a thousand laughter lines as he walked towards Gawain, his arms open wide in welcome, his hands trailing through the beautifully tended garden flowers. It was like everything about the man was one walking grin. Gawain was so disarmed by the warmth of the welcome that he quite forgot to be on his guard, and found himself smiling back as he answered, "'This is Gringley. He is my faithful friend. He was a gift to me from a king I met once,' he told the man. "'From a king, eh?' said the old man with a chuckle. "'That's fancy. We don't get much by way of kings round here. We're mostly left to ourselves, you see.' Now Gawain had had the chance to get used to the grin, he had the opportunity to take the man in fully. He saw the stranger was small, old, slightly hunched, and, now Gawain had time to notice, uncommonly ugly. Gawain was surprised that he had not noticed it before. He'd often been the first to judge people based on their appearance, but somehow none of it had seemed to matter in the light of that smile, shining like a beacon flame. "'But surely you've heard of Arthur, though?' he asked the wizened old man, the High King of all Britain. "'King Arthur?' he replied. "'Well, of course I've heard of him. Famous as they come is Arthur. So you're one of his knights, are you? Which one are you? Lancelot? Peridor? Kay?' Despite Gawain's recent adjustments in attitude, he felt a pang of jealousy that the other knights were mentioned first. It must have shown on his face, because the man burst out in good-natured laughter. "'I'm only ribbing you, lad. <laughs> I can see who you are from that great green axe on your back. You'll be Gawain then, eh?' A few months ago, Gawain might have taken offence that a man like this was making jokes at his expense, but the warm smile of the man had charmed him so much that he couldn't bring himself to muster any anger. "'Welcome, Gawain,' the man went on. "'Are you stopping in the village or just passing through?' "'I'm just passing through, I'm afraid, though if you can recommend a good inn, I'd be glad of the chance to rest and eat for a while,' he said, stretching and saddle sore. "'You'll want Rosie's place. Carry on down the road and it's on the left. You can't miss it. Tell her Bertram sent you.' "'And that's your name, is it? Bertram?' "'Me?' asked the old man, his eyes suddenly wide. "'No, I'm Derek.' There was a moment of silence while Gawain's brain caught up, and the man's face split with that glowing grin once again. (laughs) I'm only joking with you, lad. Don't mind me. Yes, Bertram's my name. Delighted to make your acquaintance. Again, that infectious grin passed over to Gawain. And yours, Bertram, he replied as he carried on into the village, a warm smile still wide on his face. On reaching Rosie's inn, he was greeted by more friendly faces. He'd only intended to stop for food and drink, then get back on his way, but with such a kind reception, he went ahead and booked a room for the night instead. Several days of hard riding and sleeping rough had left him weary and aching, and the thought of an evening spent by a warm fire with a drink in his hand and good company was really quite appealing. Having finally taken off his armour for what felt like the first time in forever, he luxuriated in a hot bath before heading downstairs for drinks and dinner. 
As he sat, a mug of excellent ale in his hand, he drew much interest from the visitors. It seemed they didn't get many strangers passing through, certainly very few knights of the round table. They welcomed him warmly, inquired after news of intrigue and interest, and made their suggestions as to where he might enjoy riding next. After a while, Gawain saw a familiar face as Bertram came in, nodded to Rosie, and approached him. "'You've settled in all right, have you?' asked the crooked old codger. "'You'll want to try one of Rosie's pies. They are the best that you will ever taste.' Gawain privately thought that he'd eaten at some of the finest tables in Britain, so he highly doubted that, but he nodded politely and made the order. So, Bertram went on, what brings you to our neck of the woods on this winter's evening then, lad? And Gawain began to tell Bertram the whole tale. As he went on, more and more of the villagers began listening and leaning in. As he described how the figure had looked as it had emerged from the fire, a listener spoke up from over in the corner. "'That sounds like you've met yourself a green man there, lad.' "'No,' replied Gawain, "'it's the Green Knight.' "'Well,' chimed in Bertram, "'I can't comment on whether he's been knighted or not, "'but I agree with Crispin over there. "'This sounds like a green man.' "'Sorry,' said Gawain, "'I'm not familiar with this fellow. "'Who's the Green Man?' "'Not the Green Man,' piped up the man called Crispin. "'A Green Man. "'So far as I know, there's more than one.' "'But who are they?' asked Gawain in confusion. He was sure he would have heard of such a creature if they were so plentiful. Eh, said Crispin with a grin. That's old magic, so you'll need an old duffer to tell you all about it. Bertram, you'll be the fellow for the job, I reckon. I'm old enough to know how to twist your ear, young Crispin, replied Bertram, but with that same smile and a wink that reassured there was no malice in it. Turning back to Gawain, he began to speak, and now it was Gawain's turn to lean in. The green men are ancient spirits of the earth and forest. They dwell all over the place, each one responsible for the forest and the nature in their realm. They say if you spend enough time in the woods you'll see them like enough, and they've been known to converse with forest dwellers and hermits and the like. But they're terrible fierce on anyone who arms their landscape or the forest or the creatures within it. They're powerful too. If you anger a green man you'll know about it, but you'll not have long to live to regret it. Gawain thought on the huge figure of the year before, and the emerald embers of its eyes, and he could well believe it. "'But why have I never seen one before?' asked Gawain. "'I've travelled the country far and wide.' "'Well,' said Bertram, a note of sadness in his voice, "'you may be travelling, but are you looking? "'You're a man of speed and stone and swift steel, "'but it takes a man who's willing to wait and watch "'and move at nature's pace to see them.' They're as ancient as the earth itself. You can hardly expect them to work to your timings now, can you? Gawain let that sink in. And then an idea came to mind. How would I defeat one? He had hoped that he might find an insight on how he could best the beast now he was surrounded by experts, but he could see he was wrong. For the first time, he saw no smiles around the room from the villagers. There was a long silence before finally Bertram spoke. Why would you want to? Gawain was wrong-footed. Um, well, I... he challenged me, you see. A green man challenged you, asked Bertram, and you took him up on that challenge. Gawain suddenly felt very small and very stupid. Well, I didn't feel like I had much of a choice. And what was the nature of that challenge? asked Crispin from the corner. I... well... Gawain didn't want to say it. Hearing how the folk of the Wirral seemed to revere the green men, he did not want to admit that he'd ever tried to harm one. But he'd started it now, so he had to go on. I cut his head off. There was a brief silence, and Gawain rushed to fill it. But it didn't work. The room erupted with laughter. Gawain had expected a series of reactions. Shock, horror, hatred, but definitely not laughter. (laughs) Chuckled Crispin. You thought that you could behead a green man. He descended into fits of laughter that echoed around the crowded inn. Hey, Rosie, did you hear that? You better bring this lad another slice of pie. He needs extra energy for that massive pear he's been carrying around. He made a surprisingly descriptive gesture, given that he'd only used one hand, and the room shrieked with laughter again. The innkeeper nodded, her eyes streaming with tears of mirth. Gawain wasn't quite sure how to react. He was dimly aware that a few months ago he'd have been on his feet with anger, with a whole room of people laughing at him like this. But somehow it wasn't the case with this crowd. 
He knew that if the tables were turned they'd all be happy to laugh at themselves with good grace, and so he felt it was only proper to do the same when the joke was on him. He just wasn't quite sure why it was funny. Bertram saw the look of confusion on his face, and with visible effort he stilled his laughter so he could explain. Look, Gawain, he began, you're a nice lad, and I'm sure you're a mighty knight in all that, but you took a swing at a creature who's older than the mountains, who's been here before our kind walked the earth and probably will be after, and you thought you could kill him with a piece of metal on a stick? The villagers burst out in laughter again. Well, said Gawain a little defensively, it is a good axe, and I've fought creatures of myth and mystery before, how was I to know it was any different? The room continued to laugh, and Crispin was slapping his hand on the table as he howled. How were you to know? he asked. Was he emerging from a blazing fire, being twelve feet tall, and oh, I don't know, being green? Not a clue that something was a bit different here, lad. He chuckled again, and Gawain gave a wry smile himself. Now that it was all explained to him, it was so obvious, but at the time it had felt... different. Bertram took pity on him again. Look, lad, began the smiling sage, it's not your fault, really. I mean, you don't know what you don't know, do you? But this is a game you were never destined to win. The deck's just too stacked against you. Gawain's heart sank at this, knowing his slim hopes of beating the Green Knight in combat were all but gone. But fear not. From what I've heard, these green men don't go around killing for no reason. I reckon there's more to play here than you know. At that moment, Rosie the innkeeper walked by and placed a piping hot pie down in front of Gawain, and Bertram went on. Whatever that green knight has to teach you, I'm sure you'll discover it in the fullness of time. For now, you enjoy that pie. I can promise you that's a game where you'll definitely come out a winner. Gawain nodded his thanks, and Bertram drifted off, leaving him to his thoughts. He pushed the pie around his plate for a little while, thinking about the inevitable end to his journey and how his last flickering hopes of escape were now doused. But you always knew how this path would end, didn't you? asked the voice in his head. So why not get each moment of joy out of it while you can? Gawain nodded to himself and took a bite of pie. As it touched his tongue, he felt all his swirling thoughts slam to a standstill as his whole mind was occupied by the flavours Rosie's pie had just delivered. Gawain had eaten at some of the fanciest halls in the world, with vaunted cooks who had studied for years, but this was definitely the finest pie he had ever tasted. He looked up and caught eyes with Rosie, who was grinning down at him warmly with a knowing smile on her face. She nodded in satisfaction, and Gawain ordered two more slices and one for the road. "'You may be walking to an inevitable end,' his inner voice said to him but there's no reason to do it on an empty stomach. Thank you for listening. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a Settle Stories Commission. Written and read for you by John Buckeridge. Story consultant was Miriam Sarin. Music was Tectonic by Syedra, downloaded via Upbeat. It was a Parable Arts production. <laughs>